Is it too cold to be out, girlies? Is it too cold to be out, those girly whirlies? Is it? Oh no! Too chilly. Not too chilly for a lily. Hello, sweetheart. Hello, darling. It's too cold, isn't it? Sorry, I've got keys in my hand. No sightings, girls? No? Don't know where mum's gone. She was right behind me. Mum? The gullies! You're out, girls. You're out. Oh, I know. Is it cosy in there, though? Yeah, it's a bit, bit nippy out here. Bit nippy. Yeah, I'll just do the shed first, girlies. Woo! <laughs> you know, we did the plot tour last week. And I said it was weird that the mulberry tree still had all its leaves because it's normally the first to go. Well, it has had a quick leaf dump. <laughs> Look at that. Overnight, basically. Overnight, like four fifths of its leaves are off. But there she is. Wondered where you disappeared to. Yeah. got sore head. Is that what it is? Can you see that? No, you can't see it. I can see it. It's blooming cold. <laughs> oh yeah. <sighs> yeah, you can see it. Yeah, we hadn't actually realised it was this cold today. Uh, so the girls have two water supplies like in their house, obviously one backup one which is tucked right under that doesn't freeze and their normal one which is like out further, totally frozen solid and we didn't bring any spare water up with us so luckily we've got um, normally like during the winter months when everything's either frozen or the water's off or whatever we bring like big bottles of, of warm water up with us but we didn't do it today because we had no idea. We had no idea. Anyway, luckily we've got some like spares stored in the shed. But yeah, it's a lot colder than we thought. But a lot of things have completely gone. So I think we're going to be doing, so I'm just looking at Lily. Um, I think we're going to be doing a good bit of clearance today and then probably freezing and going home. <laughs> but yeah, Lily, I was just looking at Lily because I think she's got like a scratch on the top of her head because she comes over for a stroke and you stroke her and then she kind of just like flinches slightly when you touch the top of her, like bottom of her ear there. So she's been in a fight. Yeah, uh, clearance, asparagus and the things on the arches really. And the dahlias need to be cut down and I am still unsure what I'm gonna do about them. Am I gonna dig them out? Or am I gonna just leave them and hope? What do you think, mum? Should we dig the dahlias out? You've got cold fingers. <laughs> Bit chilly. Oh, is it? Totally off. So I was just thinking about the dahlias, like things that you can pick up this year. If it's going to be blooming cold like last year, they've got no chance of survival. Because they're so much weakened. Like if you, if you remember how big the... I don't know. Actually, I don't even know if you can see me because the camera's the wrong way around. But the tubers were huge because obviously they've been in the ground for 
huge big tubers and when we had that real cold snap uh, last year when we dug them out like there were like one or two little bits that had survived which are what these ones are from so I don't know I mean if we have another really cold winter they're what a fifth of the size they'll um they'll surely perish maybe we should dig them out maybe we should with that asparagus. Well done, Jetty. It's sort of, I, I mean, I hesitate to say snowing. Snowing is a wild exaggeration, but there's something falling from the sky that's not rain. Snow. It's tiny, tiny snow. Back to chopping down the asparagus. This is our old asparagus bed. It has been in place for a number of years and we've been picking from this bed for years and years and years. However, up until this year, it's still been really, really strong. This year, so this spring just gone, just wasn't a great year. And I don't know whether it wasn't a great year for asparagus across the board, like I haven't heard that from anybody else, but just didn't perform. And the only thing we did differently last year is we couldn't get hold of any manure. And so we put only leaf mold on here rather than leaf mold and manure and we also had that really cold winter so yeah i'm hoping clear all this off and get a huge <laughs> layer of manure on here and we'll be back to the good times on the asparagus bed because i'm not ready for this one to be finished Last week I was saying that these arches uh, are a bit on the fragile side. Well, this one has just come to an end. <laughs> we just snappage over there and it has broken off at the bottom. However, you may remember that these were those absolute cheap bargain arches from Wilco. Oh, from Wilco. Wilco's no more. The um, first lot, this one here, that we got, we got from Wilco's and they were like nine quid each. There's two here, we tied two together and they have lasted so well. Like we've had this one and the first one on that run there, but longer than I've been doing the vlog. So it's more than three years and we've had them considerably longer than that. So probably five years for those really super cheap arches. They are 
they are quite well um, supported, but they've been brilliant. So I think that's another thing on the list is by spring, we're gonna to have to replace these. Oh, it really is snowing now. Can you see that at all? I don't think you can. It is proper snowing though, look, can I show you? Yes! Snowflake on a pussycat! Snowflake on a pussycat! Yeah, bunny rabbit, snowflake on a pussycat! It's officially pretty miserable and cold up here actually. Miserable and I've got some very cold fingers. I'm just going to finish off what I'm doing and I think I'm going to go home. It was supposed to be beautiful sunshine today. The forecast was like a little bit of grey, but from like 10 o'clock till sunset, which is what, like 3.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> 4.30 maybe. Um, it was meant to be sunny. That is not sunshine. It's grey. It's cold and now it's snowing. Back to asparagus chopping. This is our second bed of asparagus, which is just kind of coming. We picked our first lot of it this past spring. I planted 10 crowns in this bed. I have five which are Vittoria, which is a green variety. And I also have five Pacific Purple, which is a purple variety, surprisingly enough from its name. And I'm absolutely thrilled to say that all 10 crowns took. Some of them are stronger than others, but there's a couple in here that look like they're going to be real beasts. And it's actually quite rare for all 10 uh, or for all of however many you plant asparagus crowns to actually take because they can be really quite temperamental. I think that aspect of them and also the fact that they take so long to establish, like it's a bit of a long term project growing asparagus, can put people off. But I would say this is probably one of the most valuable crops on our allotment. And I don't mean valuable necessarily like in financial terms, although asparagus costs an absolute bomb in the shop. It's just really valuable in terms of the joy that it brings. And the asparagus that you grow yourself is one of those things that tastes completely different from what you can get in the shops. If you happen to live near one of those really enormous, like pick your own asparagus farms, then maybe it's not worth growing your own. But Asparagus is one of those things when people are like, oh, what would you sort of start thinking about getting in first when you get an allotment? And for me, if you're actually planning to be there for a substantial amount of time for a good number of years, first thing I would get in is asparagus, fruit trees and asparagus, because they do take a long time to establish because you want to get that root mass as strong as possible under the ground before you start picking. You could stick it on this bed, mum. Do you want to put it on that bed? You also have to be quite disciplined with how long you pick the asparagus for. It's normally six weeks, sort of halfway through May to the end of June. And then you let the plants just grow and they grow these incredible like tufty tops, which is where you can suddenly see the connection between asparagus plants that you eat and asparagus ferns, the house plant. Past the point of actually getting them established, once you've got them established, they are easy as pie and they last for years and years and years like 12 13 14 years you'll get good pickings out of an asparagus bed and in terms of maintenance you just stop picking them say at the end of june you let them grow up into these lovely big ferns you let them go until now autumn time when they start going all yellow and they die back then you just chop them down and mulch the bed and wait for next year they can require support if you get like high winds, you know, late summer when they're in sort of full leaf or full fern mode. If you get a lot of wind, they might need staking because obviously if they've got that top heavy fern blowing around in the wind, it's going to weaken the root structure underneath. But other than that, easy as pie. And like I say, one of the best things you can grow on an allotment, in my opinion. <laughs>
hiding. It's better if you can feel your hands. <laughs> <laughs> quality, quality advice. Whoa. Oh, mum's just reset it. <laughs> just come in here to show you the temperature on the uh, Dubri What's It because it got to below freezing in here last night. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but mum's already reset it. But yeah, it got to um, minus 0.9. So not, um, not a full degree below, but yeah, it was chilly, which does mean that the things like the peppers and stuff is just, it's all over for them. So I'm going to pick everything that's in here and we're supposed to have a bit of sunshine tomorrow i know we were supposed to have a bit of sunshine today but for some completely unjustifiable reason i'm more optimistic about tomorrow's sunshine <laughs> uh, so i'm just going to pick all this stuff and then i think we're going to head off i've got these to pick and then i'm also going to strip the chilies in the poly tunnel because it's just they're not going to be able to cope the poly tunnel is normally a bit colder than this anyway so it will have got to freezing in there and the chilies are going to be not -uh, not happy with that so it's a bit of a stripping mode. Well, not stripping, obviously. <laughs> Just taking the fruit. None of this fruit that I'm picking in here is like at its full size or really sort of ready to be picked exactly, but I'm gonna take it anyway. I mean, these peppers are meant to be full bell peppers. They're not. <laughs> but I have been umming and ahhing about whether or not I'm gonna save these plants. And oh, there's a little aubergine down here. Uh, whether I'm gonna save these plants or not. Look at that, nice. Uh, I was going to take them home and put them in the conservatory, you know, at the back of the kitchen, but I'm going to have a lot in that conservatory. I've got to bring the lemon tree in from the back garden and there's a couple of other bits and pieces that I want to rescue and I just don't think I'm going to have the space. Besides, I've tried it a couple of years and it's never really worked out that well. It does get quite damp in there and it's still not really warm. Chilies don't like it or peppers and things don't like it below about 10 degrees and it certainly gets colder than 10 degrees in there. tunnel and off. I'm also not going to try and save any of the chilli plants for overwintering. Again, it's a space issue. I've tried it before and uh, it hasn't been that successful. Besides, next year I am seeking the tuition of chilli growing from JB, who is the master. So I'm hoping next year is going to be wildly successful on the chilli front anyway, and I won't need any of these plants. <laughs> Do you like my optimism? Some of these chilies are actually all good, done, ready to be picked and in full colour in their beautiful red plumage. However, a lot of them are still green. I'm going to pick the whole lot again, just like with the peppers. But most of the full size ones of these chilies, OK, they haven't changed colour, but they're at the right size. They will just change colour on the window ledge at home. So I'm not worried about those at all. Some of the little ones, I'm still going to pick them. They'll taste good. <laughs> The winter growing in here, however, is pretty much a complete fail. <laughs> All of the things that I've put in have just been eaten. And I'm starting to think that it's a blessing in disguise because I've got coriander and parsley growing away happily in here, but the rest of it, there's no chard, there's no mustard greens, there's no turnips, there's none of the things that I was hoping to be growing in here over winter. However, modifications do need to be made in here. And so that is just going to be so much easier with nothing growing in here. So look on the bright side. Everything was a fail, <laughs> but maybe for a reason, maybe for a reason. Right, chaps, I'm going to pick the rest of these chilies. I'm going to sort the girly whirlies out, pick a load of Cavalanero, And then there is a shower tray at home 
singing my name. Today is not the glorious uh, blue skies and sun that we were expecting. In fact, it's now uh, after lunchtime, it's like one o'clock and uh, all morning. So yesterday it said like from like dawn, it was gonna be clear skies and sunshine. And then every, every hour it's just pushed it back to more gray, more gray, more gray. Now it says it's gonna be sunny at two, but it has said it's gonna be sunny every hour so far today and it hasn't happened. So I suspect two is also going to come and go with no sunshine. It is so cold. It's so cold. What I really want to be doing is being at home under the duvet. But I'm not. I'm here. So I better do something. Oh, man. Okay, excitement, big news, like news flash. Trail cam is on plot 37. It is still in the box, but it's about to be revealed. And uh, yeah, 
I might have to have a uh, trail cam off with JB, who has also recently put a trail cam on his plot to spot the fox that's been eating the side of his polytunnel. But we might be having footage of the dastardly badger very soon. Anyway, I'm not great with reading like battery instructions, so <laughs> wish me luck. First thing to say is a huge thank you to Steve for this. This is uh, amazing. Second thing to say is it's called a You So Good. <laughs> what a great name. It is a You So Good TC30 trail cam. I will put a link for it underneath in the description of the video. However, let's see how it works first before we all rush out and buy one. of to-dos, the mighty list of to-dos today, but it's things like we've decided that where the as asparagus, not asparagus, where the rhubarb is uh, up in that bed up there, it's just uh, not the right place for it. Um, and not only is it not the right place for it, but do you remember we moved the rhubarb last year and uh, we thought we might have crown rot? Well, we moved it, gave it loads of feed and everything, and it just came up really weak and it's still got crown rot. <laughs> Shock horror. Um, so what we're going to do is get rid of that and we're going to use that bed because it's in the shade up there we are going to use it sorry I've still got my hands over the heater they are so cold um, back on point Jesse uh, yeah we're going to put some uh, a new rhubarb plant we're going to buy a new rhubarb um, and put that in the bed next to the polytunnel so it'll be near the water butt at the back so it gets a lot of morning sun a lot more morning sun than it does at the top end and I think it should be quite happy down there and that bed that we currently have it in uh, needs to be really well topped up and then we're going to grow some stuff which enjoys growing in the shade in there so um, a lot of stuff over the middle of the summer like spinach and pak choy and stuff which can bolt in the heat we'll grow that in there and um, we can have lettuces and chard and lots of things that actually can grow quite happily in the shade and it's not total shade like it does get part sunshine and it's not dry shade because it's in a built up raised bed that we've put a lot of goodies in so I think the space will still be useful um, it's just not going to be for rhubarb uh, but that's like what I was saying, it's like that's one of the jobs that we have to do today is to turf the old rhubarb out, um, build up that bed, that's on my list for today. But it, it, I mean, there's no time pressure on it. And to be perfectly honest, it's not nice up here. The air is just, it's wet, you know, it's not raining, but it's damp and it's really cold. <laughs> and I think we're just, we've set the camera up, which is exciting. But that's about as much excitement as I could handle for the day. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm going to go home and do a bit of work on plans for next year. It's mostly like infrastructure plans, to be honest. Um, I haven't, I'm, I'm starting up my list of like varieties and stuff that I want to grow next year. Um, but I haven't really kind of nailed that yet. And I'm not forcing myself into it because I've still got a month until I'm going to be sowing chilies and aubergines seems ridiculous that it's only a month but it is only a month oh yeah <laughs> i forgot to say happy december it's december by the way yeah uh, basically it's just too cold to do anything chaps and we are beating a hasty retreat cheers chaps 
apologies for your slightly precarious if you feel yourself wobbling you're in an interesting setup currently in my office here i've got all like the shower bits and everything out of the bathroom is all stacked in my little tiny office at the back of the house so it's all a bit like crammed in <laughs> but still uh yeah what a blooming cold week what a blooming cold week i mean i know it's december and it's supposed to be cold but still it was proper icy and a bit of a shocker after having such a warm autumn up until this point Just pausing the video chaps and uh, not just apologising for the wobbly camera. Um, uh, there is a noise going on in the back of this that I can't hear with my own ears in the room, but it's picked up on the camera and I apologise. It, it goes all the way through this. It just kind of like in the background. So huge apologies. Sometimes these things happen. Sorry, chaps. Sorry. However, what I wanted to talk to you about was plans for next year. So in absolutely no great detail, because obviously, firstly, these things change as you're going along. But secondly, it is only December. And the only thing that I really need to sort of do, have decided by January is what chilies I'm growing, which to be fair is a difficult choice in itself. <laughs> but I've been thinking a lot, especially since we've been like clearing, I've been thinking a lot about the things which worked this year, obviously, and the things that didn't work this year. And I will do a whole video on um, what I think was a success and what was a fail. But we had some really quite outstanding, classic, that no holes barred fails this year. Uh, there are quite a lot of them, actually, more than is kind of standard. <laughs> it's just been one of those years. And I was just discussing it with mum and something that totally failed, sweet corn. Uh, absolute fail. We started our own ones and got them in. They failed. We realised that there was something wrong with them, like they weren't looking hot. So uh, we went out and actually bought some in, you know, like a starter's tray uh, from the garden centre, planted them. They also failed. So sweet corn uh, was, a, was just a wipeout this year, which is a real shame because I love sweet corn. And uh, that's another one, a bit like the asparagus, that it tastes so different. Uh, when you grow it yourself because the, the sugar levels of the sweet corn just absolutely plummet the moment you pick them like you can tell if you go up to the allotment and you pick your sweet corn like when you first get there because you're overexcited, and then you're up there for another like three hours or something and you come home it does not taste the same as when you pick it just as you're leaving then eat it when you get home so obviously the stuff that you buy in the shops the sugar levels have absolutely plummeted and uh yeah it, it tastes like it tastes like boiled sweeties <laughs> And so I didn't get any of that this year, which was a real shame. So that's something I'm going to really try and focus on getting some of next year. And actually, the sweet corn is probably the only thing that failed that I have no idea why it failed. There didn't seem to be any reason. It was two different varieties grown in two different ways. It was just a complete null and void. Some things that were fails, I know exactly why they were fails. The chickpeas, which was very exciting. First year I'd grown chickpeas. Firstly, I started them too late. And secondly, I had no idea how they grew. Turns out they're actually quite um, small plants. I mean, not small height-wise, but they're quite spindly and everything I'd seen of them, uh, they were like these really thick hedges. Well, it turns out they're really thick because there's a lot of plants in there. <laughs> and I didn't know that. So I planted mine out really carefully, like a foot apart. And they were just like these little twigs. Oh, you're waving, sorry. Try and stop you. Um, yeah, so chickpeas, definitely going to go with them again next year, but plant them in a totally different way, much closer together like you would normal peas. So that's one thing. The other thing was tomatillos. I got them in, but I got them in way too late and they'd only just started forming their like, like lanterns before the frost hit. So that's another thing that I'm going to try and get in earlier. Okay, talking flowers for next year. What didn't work this year was the sweet peas really suffered. Um, they would fail. We got a few flowers off them, but uh, it was just too hot at the time we planted them out. Didn't go very well. Going again with them next year. Something else that didn't work out was the wildflower section. Um, everything just got completely taken off by slugs really early in the year, so that didn't work out too well. But on the success front, the zinnias this year 
were outstanding, as were the nasturtiums. Now the nasturtiums I'm going to be uh, just letting regrow where they've like dropped their seeds. So I should have like my little nursery of nasturtiums in there. So there's a whole mix of ones that have mixed over the years, but I've got two varieties to add to that, or three actually, because one's a mixed packet. So I've got a rumba mix, which sounds pretty exciting. It's got like a little salmon one and quite a dark red one. And I've got purple emperor. How pretty does that look? So I'm gonna add them into the mix so we should have like a vast array of nasturtiums next year. And on the zinnia front, I picked up, <laughs> stupid names, Zinderella peach, but look at that beauty. Doesn't that look delicious? Uh, so I'm gonna get some of those in. Also, I saw this pack here, which is called Whirly Gigs. So obviously for the girly, whirly, whirly gigs, I had to get that, but they do look really nice. That's like a mixed packet. I've also saved a load of seed from the zinnias that we grew ourselves this year, which were beautiful. I've never tried to grow zinnias uh, from saved seed. I'm assuming they grow all right, but we'll find out. But I've got two new packets to add to it anyway. And really the other thing I've been thinking about was the beans. So this year, uh, we had a lot of slug damage this year. Slugs seem to have been, where's my beer? I slug cough, got a really dry throat. <laughs> Forgot my beer. That is better. Um, what was I saying? Beans. So the slug damage, that's what I was talking about, <sighs> had terrible, terrible slug damage this year. I mean, just at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, it wasn't too bad. Beginning of year, end of the year, atrocious. Started off, the bean drama started off, if you can look back into the mists of time and remember, uh, that was down to a number of things and I think one of them was the compost that I was using. So I used uh, a compost uh, that was very kindly given to me but turned out I wasn't that impressed with it and I'll be going back to um, Silver Grow which is just in my opinion the best peat free compost out there. Um, it's just so consistent. Anyway this compost that I used what happened was uh, it was very very fibrous and when I sowed the bean seeds, so bean seeds are obviously you know generally really quite large so I've got my pots, sowed my bean seeds into it with this compost on top and the compost formed a mat on top. You do often get that with peat free compost, like it forms a bit of a cap, but this was like beyond a bit of a cap. It formed like a concrete box on top, but it then trapped the water in underneath. So the beans all started sprouting. At first I thought it was just terrible germination, but when I kind of rooted around it, they'd all started growing. But because they had this cap on top that they actually couldn't force through, that's how strong this mesh was on top of them, because bees can pretty much poke through anything. It not only stopped them coming up, but it trapped the moisture in underneath and rotted everything out. So it was just absolutely abysmal stuff. Uh, so I won't be doing that again. <laughs> we didn't actually realise that was the problem at the time. That was part of the issue. It was only like later on when I started investigating, like, digging around that I realised that's what happened. So we re-sowed repeatedly thinking it was a germination issue. We ended up getting maybe about three or four French beans out of this lot and I planted them up the archways at the edge of the pot, as you'll remember, where I normally grow them, but they are very, very vulnerable to slug damage along that side because our neighbour has a lot of black plastic down there to repress his weeds. Uh, it doesn't work to repress his weeds very well, but what it does do is provide bliss for the slugs. So they're all lying under there, I plant my beans out, I've served lunch, out they come. So my solution to this is, traditionally we grow runner beans, bolotti beans and Greek gigantes up those three centre uh, arches that we've got, the one that I broke this week by the way, <laughs> gonna have to do some replacements there. But that's where we normally grow those three beans because they're the most vigorous and then we put the French beans sort of elsewhere. Well, we had a really good year. Once we actually got some germinated growth, I think what the problem was, we had a really, really good year for Bellottis and Greek Gigantes. And because they are a drying bean and a saving bean, we now have a freezer absolutely full of those beans. And I do not think we are gonna need more than that for next year. So we're going to switch from growing Greek Gigantes and Bellottis every single year, we're going to grow them one year on, one year off because we get enough from that. So next year, I'm gonna grow my beautiful French beans, which is my favorite beans, up the center arches where they are way more protected than the edge and beans just grow so much better up the center arches. So the French beans are going up the middle arches. We're not doing Bellotti and we're not doing Greek Gigantes, not because they are not 
outstanding, exceptional beans. Purely because we've got enough of them. And I tell you what, to talk about like brassicas and things, tried a whole load of new brassicas this year, which was quite exciting. Some of them I found abroad and some of them were just ones that we're going to be growing for the first time this year. But we, I won't know if they've been a success or not until like early spring. So I can't make a judgment call on them yet. But something that I do know that I really want to do next year is to try and reestablish our uh, perennial brassicas that really suffered last year. We lost a load of them. So the three that I grew, or the four that I grew, oh, I can't even count on my fingers, the four <laughs> that we grew, we've had uh, Asturian tree cabbage for years, fantastic, lost all but one of the plants this year and the one plant that did survive isn't looking too hot. Uh, so I'm going to regrow them, I've got seed for that. Secondly was the nine star broccoli, which is a pure joy. And again, I had three really huge plants of that and um, all but one of them died. And the one that survived really had a bit of a hard time. So although it's coming back now, it's, it's had a hard time. So I'm gonna reestablish them. And I find myself in possession of some nine star broccoli seeds with a huge thank you to Simon who sent these to me along with some raw beans. Absolute joy, thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm going to get them started. I'm going to get the Asturian cabbage trees started. I also want to re-establish um, my Taunton Dean kale that died, and the third one, and the fourth, and the fourth one that I grow uh, is still going strong, which is the um, sea kale, the cranberry. So that one's still going fine, but that was right next to the greenhouse and quite well protected. Plus, it normally grows on the coast in like quite dicey conditions, so that's a real tough one. The other two, I'm going to try and re-establish them with a mind that they might need protection for winter. And one of the things that I really, really do need to consider for next year is space. <laughs> so I tend to go like wildly year on year, like I'm like fluctuating between I'm going to grow everything and then I kind of like refine it down for the things that worked the year before and things I want to try again and then wild and then reduce it down. Last year I grew a lot of tomatoes. I had to cut out a lot of varieties. And it's mainly down to a chap called Chris who keeps sending me incredible tomato varieties. And look at this, right? This is new tomato varieties that he's sent me that I haven't grown yet. There's absolute stunners in here that I'm desperate to try. And I've already got that, what was it last year? 52 varieties of tomatoes in my boxes behind me. I, I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do. I think what I'm going to have to do is hand these out and try and get other people to grow them so I can try the tomatoes, <laughs> but not have to grow. Because I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to polytunnel my entire plot and just grow tomatoes if I wanted to do all these. What are you doing to me, man? <laughs> Something that is quite exciting though. Um, we are, I say we, um, it's kind of the, the borough of Richmond allotment group are trying to put together a seed swap in January so exciting times and considering the amount of seed in these packets I mean look at that like if I'm going to be growing two of each I've got so much seed here it's amazing um, I will be putting like uh, dividing these up and trying to spread them across the borough and we might just have the most exciting tomatoes in the whole of England in this borough next year anyway chaps where's my beer again I have talked enough. I have talked enough. I mean, it's only December. No plans are set in stone. This is just sort of what I'm thinking at the moment. When we've really narrowed it down a bit, I will come back to you <laughs> with my final plans. But if you've got any thoughts on any of that ramble that I've just given you, please hit me down below in the comments and I will see you next week. So it is cheers chaps it is thank you to the magnificent patrons who will be watching this or most of them will be watching this on a monday night they get it 24 hours earlier than it goes out on youtube with no adverts Woohoo! <laughs> exciting times chaps anyway cheers to everybody else as well i hope if you're in this hemisphere you have stayed warm because it's been whoo, and if you're in the other hemisphere you've stayed cool because i've heard it's been whoo, there as well the opposite end. Anyway, cheers chaps. Mm. Oh, I'm going to leave you with a bit of a teaser.
Get your bum out of the way. Get your bum out of the way, madam.